Hi, welcome to the Estonian Experience with Stu and Jay. I'm Stuart. I'm Jason. And we have a special guest today, uh, Tavi Roivas. Hi, everyone. So could I ask you, for people who are not maybe so familiar with Estonia, uh, who are you? Me? Yes. Uh, well, uh, I used to be Prime Minister of Estonia, a lovely country, by the way, for those of you who haven't been here. But now I'm uh, working as chairman of a company that uh, designs and produces autonomous vehicles. So I'm a politician turned to tech entrepreneur. I told you he was the Prime Minister. You should just ask. Just yeah, but didn't. that was in uh, the times when I was still young. So I was <laughs> I was the youngest in the EU. Uh, I was 34 when I started, and by the age of 37, I was uh, two-time ex-prime minister, but still, I would say, relatively young. So hence, I decided that there is still something in me to pursue for for changes and and to to offer myself challenges. Impressive, though. So do you, do you like the? former life compared to the newer life or, or you still trying to find a way? I, I very much enjoyed being in politics. I did that for 20 years. It's hugely rewarding, a lot of very interesting things to do. Uh, you actually, you know, anything, you know, from working at municipal level to the government level, you have the huge uh, impact to, to how things uh, move in, in either your region or in Estonia. But uh, of course, I enjoy now more what I'm doing currently because mm -hmm. uh, uh, there are not uh, like those paths for me that I have already taken. And that's why I, I feel that uh, as a 41-year-old, as I, I still develop and I still have a lot of uh, challenges and, and I have still a lot to give. Interesting. I really appreciate that you say that at the age of 40, that you still have a lot of stuff to develop and learn because a lot of people, younger kids, my kids, say that, oh, you're old, you're, you're, you're expired already. So I, I, like, <laughs> yeah, I like your energy, I respect There, there was a, a guy, like civil servant, uh, in, or a head of, um, of a government-owned company in Estonia who said that people past 45 years are not able to uh, learn anything new. And there were lots of people congratulating him on his 45th birthday. That was like almost <laughs> the next week or something. But I, I don't belong to uh, believing this. I think uh, I think it's actually the contra uh, like it's contrary, like contrary uh, because uh, at the age of uh, 40 ish, you already have a lot of um, experience uh, that you can build on, and you still have a lot of energy that you can utilize. So in a way, it's it's the best time. Yeah, that's interesting. Like uh, I've 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 started learning Estonian, and I'd, if you if you want to hear me try to say something in Estonian, Please I'll try it right now. Okay, here goes. <laughs> Are you ready? Tell upon tell you don't draw me, Mika. You have you have the best uh, speed speaking uh, course that is available because it's all, almost every day, uh, every hour in, in TV or, yeah. or uh, yeah. radio. But uh, that's probably not the most important phase you, or like you need to know in Estonia. But but we will teach you some more. And, and uh, Estonian language is uh, not the easiest, but it is truly beautiful, especially when uh, you sing it. So. Also, we should start singing. Then. Yeah, this country is known for singing something like the singing revolution, evolution, revolution, something like that. Yeah. <laughs> evolution, <laughs> okay. evolution. And we're going to continue talking about the great things about living in Estonia. And Stuart, you wanted to say something? On our last episode, you promised to teach me something in Estonian. <laughs> so let's have at it. You already have a sentence in well, mind? Well, as you already uh, know a lot of uh, words or phrases that you don't need ever, then I will teach you uh, another one. Like tere tere wana kere? That's actually something that you, you can use. It's not the politest uh, phrase. But what I would like to teach you is um, uh, a word that consists of uh, five words. That's probably one of the longest words in Estonian, and it's Alma Raute Jam. Alma Raute Jam. Alma Raute Jam. Well, what is it? Alma Raute Jam. Yeah, you are both very good. In Alma Raute Jam. Yes, I say Alma Raute Jam because they don't get sweet seed. Sweet seed. Couldn't have put in the Oria. So it's actually it's, it's five five words. Alma Raute Jam, and it means subway station. Yeah. Oh, interesting. I was making a joke about it being the underground railroad, <laughs> which took escaped slaves out of the deep south before the civil war. I have a question for you, though, if you don't mind. Like you have traveled around the world, you know, representing the country, and I'm interested to know about. What is the difference, or what have you seen the difference between Estonians now uh, from Estonia and the different Estonians around the world? Because a lot of them, you know, mm -hmm. they escaped whatever happened in the past here, and I'm interested to know, like, are they different 
than the Estonians we have nowadays here in, mm. in the country? The Estonian diasporas. Um, well, a lot of Estonians uh, fled the country uh, because of war and, and Soviet occupation, so it happened already in the 40s. This means that those people who were born in Estonia, uh, they are uh, already quite old, uh, and, and those people whom you see as diaspora, a lot of them have um, been born to, mm -hmm. let's say, in New York, in, in Sweden, in, in, in many, many other countries. So, so it's quite difficult to, to compare, but they still uh, cherish Estonian uh, language and culture very much. This is something that Estonians uh, are known for. You know, there is only roughly one million people who can speak our mm -hmm. secret language, and this means that um, we are almost allergic to anything that threatens that. And, uh, and what has happened to, to those generations, it might be third or, or fourth even generation already born in, let's say, United States, uh, they still uh, learn Estonian, they sing in Estonian, they have their special schools. So, so that's something that you immediately understand. Uh, secondly, if you look at the Estonians who have moved uh, out, let's say, to, to some uh, to, to, to other countries uh, recently, um, it depends very much on what they do, whether they went to Finland for construction or whether they are uh, you know, among those who do this international business uh, as uh, tech entrepreneurs, as startup people, it could be very different in terms of profile. I've, I've known a lot of Estonians who listen to this uh, Valley Stejslase music, like mm -hmm. uh, expatriated Estonians music. Uh, for example, there is a band, I don't remember the name of it at the moment, but they mm -hmm. were in Canada, and they sing purely in Estonian, which is cool. Mm -hmm. But my friends who are you know, Estonian Estonians, they found the accent hysterical. <laughs> and when I speak Estonian with them, they're like, uh, you sound better than these Canadian Estonians. <laughs> like me, well, I sound better. I, I do understand that, of course, if you live in Canada the whole life, you, you start speaking as a Canadian, you, you, you have your intonation as Canadian. The same is, you know, if you live the whole life in Estonia and, and you can learn all the language you can, but, but you still have some, some Estonian accent. So, so in a way, it's perfectly normal. Uh, secondly, what we do see uh, is that uh, those people who live very far from Estonia, Canada, Australia, US, uh, they tend to be very patriotic. They, they yeah. very much cherish uh, uh, Estonian uh, Independence Day, uh, Estonian black bread, all this. We, I wouldn't say that this is not dear to us uh, living in Estonia, of course it is. But, uh, the Estonians living uh, far, uh, coming together, this is like a special ceremony. So, so I have visited, of course, Estonian diaspora in, in many locations. And, and of course, being a politician from, or having been a politician from Estonia, coming to visit them, I have witnessed that this is always a huge thing for them. I have encountered many of these people on social media, and especially during times of American elections. The foreign Estonians, or the expatriated Estonians, from my experience, quite often turn out to be the strongest, biggest Trump supporters I've seen at all. And that includes misspelling their words on purpose. <laughs> uh, that would be a surprise, but... Uh, I'm surprised too. Yeah, I mean, uh, the funniest thing that I have noticed about Estonian politics, or one of the funniest things, uh, uh, which is somewhat related to Trump politics, is that uh, uh, a lot of Estonians who live abroad uh, as um, expats themselves they tend to support very strongly strong politics against expats coming to Estonia. Mm. Uh, so they s support ECRE, which is basically the Estonian analog of, of Trump politics, if yeah. we can generalize this way. And, and those people living abroad uh, are very likely or much more likely uh, to support uh, Trump politics. You mentioned you're no longer in politics. So I would like to know more about the new person, the new Tavi. Mm. Well, uh, I work for Ovitech, which uh, develops and produces uh, level 4 autonomous vehicles. And uh, our belief is that there is no question whether there will be a uh, machine taking over uh, routine jobs of people. Of course, it will happen. The question is, uh, what can we do to make it happen sooner? And our uh, sweet spot or our sector is uh, autonomous transport. And of course, the bigger picture is how to reduce CO2 emission, how to reduce the need for personal cars, how to look out of the window and not to see only parking lots. Um, you know, with autonomous vehicles, you can 
take a subway or, or train and, and then from the train station to in front of your uh, building, be it home or, or office, mm -hmm. you can just take a shuttle. So um, yeah, we don't think that autonomous uh, driving will only happen tomorrow. We already have more than 10 uh, road legal vehicles ourselves in, in our company and we believe that there will be many more. They said that that's how everything starts, then the machines go back to kill Sarah Connor. That's right. how the singularity happens. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I do understand the threats and I do understand this um, um, concern and, and I think it's legit concern. But just like with uh, um, digital government that Estonia is very well known for, most of the threats, uh, if you know them, if you understand them, they are addressable and, and you can take care of that or you can minimize the threat. And the same is with autonomous driving. Uh, if you address uh, the threats, it can be many, many times safer than human beings. Well, but what, what's going to happen if we have all kinds of machines doing all of our jobs? Then what do we do? Like we're all going to turn into America, Americans. Yeah, we do. Uh, we do cool, uh, cool <laughs> podcast. I mean, this has happened cool uh, <laughs> for centuries. Uh, that you know, imagine how many people uh, worked uh, years ago just to make this table, and mm -hmm. now it comes from uh, some sort of machine. So there is less manual labor already if you compare to 100 years ago, 200 mm -hmm. years ago, and none of us would want to have uh, the majority of the jobs that were available 200 years ago. Uh, hence, I believe that this trend, which accelerates, uh, is actually continuing that uh, uh, more routine jobs are being done by machines and we have time and, and possibility to do something more meaningful, some more value-add things. And so, at the same time, sorry to interrupt, at the same time, more, more jobs are being created in a different way. Exactly. So. I, I mean, the world is not running uh, out of things to do okay. uh, and also value-add things to do. So the, just the jobs will change and there still will be jobs say, in, in 20 or 30 years as well. Well, we have to wrap up, to wrap up this episode, but I just wanted to mention, like, so if we have all this free time from you know autonomous uh, factory production and so on, do you expect something like a, uh, an explosion in the number of poets um, in, in society? It what can, are people going it to do? It can be, but uh, there can be also different jobs uh, that uh, uh, do something uh, totally different than, uh, than human beings are, are doing today. Uh, if you have computers, you need uh, less people uh, typing but, uh, or, or writing down things, but you need people uh, to program the, uh, the computers. So, mm -hmm. so the, the jobs will, will change and, and the, the opportunities that we can experience uh, can definitely change. Okay, Play. very good. Uh, as promised, I'm going to ask uh, him about his opinion about Skynet. For those of you who don't know, uh, Skynet was basically a fictional film supercomputer developed in the future and it basically caused a nuclear Armageddon that wiped out most of humanity, except there was a resistance, and they sent these intelligent machines called Terminators back into the past to kill the leader of the resistance. And Tavi's so, working on that right now. So. Yeah, we're not, um, we know that you're not working on that. <laughs> no, 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 not really. <laughs> we are uh, doing uh, much simpler things. We are just uh, getting uh, rid of uh, so many cars. Uh, I'm glad you didn't say people. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're getting rid of personal cars, or for the, for the need of personal cars, and then get you much more comfortably from point A to point B. Okay, but the question I was leading up to with the whole Skynet thing is more of, I guess, a, a software ethics question. Mm -hmm. So, you know, in a, inadvertent, inevitably, there's going to be a situation where a driverless car has to choose between killing uh, an old woman crossing the street or killing mm -hmm. a young mother with a baby carriage. You know, it can't be avoided. You have to choose the lesser of two evils. Uh, how, does, how does this programming work? Uh, first of all, um, uh, the where autonomous driving legally is right now is that uh, the cars are uh, not driving 100 kilometers an hour or, or 100 miles an hour they are driving up to 25 kilometers an hour and any kind of collision is basically possible to or the risk it can be minimized and, and in case of collision uh, the the likelihood of uh, fatal accidents is is very 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 small so in a way we are in this spot right now where um, the ethical questions uh, need to be addressed but but the likelihood is taken as as minimal as as humanly possible so so that's something that uh, i think is important to um, to emphasize now um, the cars or or the machines usually do what humans tell them to do and then they can be extremely accurate in that so in a way this is something that we need to agree on as humans, whether there can be this kind of um, 
uh, ethical decisions or we need to you know be able to uh, to uh, um, have procedures uh, to eliminate this risk uh, entirely what i'm talking about uh, in some cases uh, uh, the best way to limit the machine is actually very manual. You don't uh, allow people walking there where, where some autonomous uh, things uh, like trains or, or buses drive very fast or, or you just, again, minimize the risk with, with sometimes very simple uh, uh, solutions. Uh, having said that, I think it's still relatively uh, distant time when we will be seeing in the streets of Tallinn uh, uh, tens of thousands uh, cars all driving fully autonomously. I don't think uh, the society is fully ready for that. I think we need to uh, first get acquainted to the to the level four uh, and possibly level five uh, autonomous uh, driving slowly, driving um, uh, as risk-free as possible, and then learn from that and then decide which is the best way to to address this ethical issue. Now that for us is actually quite quite exciting because you know we're over 40 years old. I'm curious to know about what your kids think about this. Like uh, you know they are grown up with this kind of you know power in their hands you know. But let, me, let me put it this way. My, my grandfather uh, bought uh, a car when he was um, I think like um, more than 40 years old and this was like real estate purchase. This was for life. It was a uh, Moswitch, uh, mm. Soviet uh, car, but this was really like a real estate investment. Now my father's generation, they are still very much like car is an ownership. Uh, I own it, I pay it up front. I am more like, uh, you know, it's, it's a leasing payment um, every, every uh, month. And my kids, they think like how I get from point A to point B. They don't care if it's a car, if it's a you know, helicopter, if it's, a, if it's an autonomous shuttle, if it's a bus, Uber, Bolt, whatever. Uh, so so it, it has changed the way how we think about uh, uh, transportation and it has changed the way uh, how we think about uh, owning things. So, so car does not have to be something that you necessarily own in the, in the near future. Yeah, something that you can steal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I would like to uh, know your opinions about the future of uh, clean electrical production in Estonia. Well, is there uh, a future? Here? Of course, there is. Uh, there has to be. And uh, I was actually there in 2015 in, in, when uh, the Paris Agreement was uh, agreed on, and uh, and uh, sat between uh, the Prime Minister of Spain and. Um, and uh, now climate envoy of the United States, uh, then Foreign Minister uh, John Kerry. Um, and, and we all co committed to this, uh, that we will become more gr green, we will uh, start uh, uh, polluting less and, and so forth. So in a way, there is no, no question about it. Uh, it, it has to be go this way. Um, now, obviously we don't have enough sun uh, most of the time, uh, we get like, uh, more than 1.5 times less than south of Europe if we install one kilowatt uh, of uh, solar power. So we need also alternatives. Uh, Estonian state-owned energy company has been exploring uh, very seriously um, offshore uh, windmills. So that's something that uh, has a bit more, uh, let's say, uh, resilience to, to also all, all kinds of weather. So there is more, more wind available but we still need something to store the energy if it comes from wind or if it comes from solar. So I think uh, one of the buzzwords and, and one of the hot topics definitely has become uh, hydrogen, uh, how to produce it, how to store it, what to do with it. Um, and I'm quite confident that um, this decade will take a leap forward in hydrogen technology both in, in consumption and also production. Oh, these are pretty safe technologies too. You know, hydrogen, so long as it doesn't randomly explode, which, you know, they're, they're making huge leaps and bounds. And it has never happened before. Yeah. It, it has <laughs> happened, but they, there's a hydrogen powered airplane that was recently, uh, the prototype was flown in Germany as a hydrogen car, uh, sorry, train there. Uh, I believe that there's tremendous uh, mm -hmm. potential for hydrogen. What do you think about the proposed nuclear power plant that they want in Estonia? Yeah. I think it actually, uh, uh, needs to be like properly discussed in the society in terms of uh, of uh, both environmental impact and, and uh, societal impact. Uh, 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 some Estonians still remember uh, the Chernobyl accident, which you know it 
doesn't have any connections to obviously because it's so much newer technology, but it would be wrong uh, to just overlook it and just start pushing it. Uh, whatever big uh, industrial uh, uh, let's say object and, and uh, not even talking about like huge energy production unit, you need to win the society over before you, you can start building it. Yeah, I, I agree with you. And also, I'd like to point out that you know nobody ever talks about the major catastrophe that happened in 1986 in Chernobyl when the massive solar power plant shut down because it was a cloudy day. You know, <laughs> solar is like a, it's basically a completely risk-free technology. Okay, we can't use solar, but as you mentioned, wind is a great alternative in Estonia. Uh, it is, but but there there also needs to be uh, some sort of. Uh, like base uh, power. Uh, I mean, with wind and solar, the biggest problem is that when it is um, uh, winter night, the consumption is very high, or just dark winter day, the consumption is very high, the production is simply not there. You need to find some sort of uh, solution for that. So, uh, will it be storing of hydrogen? Will it be um, nuclear? Will it be something else? I'm pretty much sure that we are, uh, or we, we don't have an alternative of, of uh, kind of moving away from um, oil shale, even though it has been, of course, for a century, uh, if not more, a very important energy source for Estonia, but, but this simply cannot uh, continue because of the huge CO2 emissions, so it, gradually we need to fade away. Well, there needs to be honest discussion, what are the alternatives, and, and we cannot just rely on only what our uh, neighbors are producing uh, because when there is cold uh, winter day, it will be cold winter day also in Finland and Latvia. Which neighbors are you talking about now? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for staying here for so long. Uh, we were talking about energy production in Estonia and some alternatives. Now, something that's growing in this country would be biomass. Mm -hmm. Besides me, of course. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're using this guy for energy production. He eats a lot of beans. I'm growing a lot. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think of biomass, though? And, and does that affect deforestation in the country? That's a hot topic right uh, now. Around 15 years ago, there was a US president coming to Estonia and talking to Estonian uh, prime minister, then prime minister, and he said something like that, that you, you chopped out a tree and then you burn it and you call it the green energy. Uh, so he was a bit <laughs> confused. Uh, that was George W. Bush, by the way. But uh, in a way, it's not, you know, if you look uh, chopping down a tree in Central Park and chopping down a tree in a country where we have uh, 52% of the uh, land mass covered with forest, it's light, like a bit different thing. And, and those forests, of course, need to be, uh, you, you need to make the best of it without uh, uh, sacrificing the nature, of course. So, mm. so I think biomass uh, continues to be a very important energy source for us. Uh, it's uh, renewable, obviously, and, and there's a lot of things that you can do with it. So. Yeah, I think uh, that's we are we're lucky to have uh, one of the biggest uh, percentages uh, of uh, land covered with beautiful forests, and and uh, if we maintain them uh, properly, we can also make a good use of it. It's funny that you mentioned the forest. That when I came here the first time, I asked you know why you guys have so much forest everywhere. Mm -hmm. the, f the first answer was we need to heat up our saunas. <laughs> So uh, that was like, whoa, it kind of blew my mind. But, yeah. <laughs> but I, I'd like to clarify one thing that you've, I've heard this so many, many times from many people that 52% of Estonian landmass is covered in forest. Mm -hmm. That's not exactly accurate though, because when there are huge clear cuttings done, uh, they leave these seed trees, which always, mo like half of them fall down within a year because they're not, their roots are not simply not structured to withstand the wind. Basically you have an entire clear cut area, but official government statistics do not reclassify this land that's clear cut. It's still officially mm -hmm. forest, but there's no forest there. Yeah, well, the the actual I, I under, I is understand. closer to twenty five percent. It's uh, no, it, it's it's much higher because it's less than half of the of the forest by far that is is with clear cut. And you, you, the only thing you need to do is to get down into a small airplane or helicopter and fly over Estonia, and you will be assured that there is absolutely no crisis in terms of uh, like uh, the forest. Uh, uh, ending in, in, in any way. There is plenty of forest and if we compare with the, so to say, Estonian time, which is uh, pre-war independence time, uh, the, the land, land mass covered with forest has grown considerably. And that's mainly because of less land is used for agriculture, but still we, we, we do have plenty of forest. The only ones having more forest than us are uh, Swedes and Finns, but uh, 
we are close to them. Well, they have bigger countries, that's why. Uh, but they, also, in, in terms of percentage, they are slightly higher. But so they, because they, they have those Ikea farms everywhere where they grow the furniture. <laughs> so there you go, guys. You, have nothing, the forest. you guys, nothing to worry about. We can continue using, you know, hitting up our saunas with the forest. Yeah. Thank hey. you once again for joining us. <laughs> Thank you for now, having you. Jay, I believe you have a somewhat serious question to ask. It's the very serious, very serious. As a former prime minister, I know you didn't want to talk about politics, but I need to know, I need to know secrets, mm -hmm. government secrets. <laughs> Please tell us, at least they exist. Specifically, UFO, UFO experiences, you know, around the world. Do you know any of that? Uh, the first thing that you are taught when you are introduced uh, with the permission of, of uh, being able to access state secrets is that even the fact what you know is a secret. So that's where the discussion has they, to end, unfortunately. The you all guys, aliens, they're here. <laughs> Says the alien. <laughs> Says one alien to another alien. No, the reason I ask And I have no way of confirming, neither denying it. <laughs> I love that, I love that. <laughs> the reason I ask is because, you know, I know obviously this is something that he really hot topic for any politician, former or current, to talk about. But it's very interesting for me to know that how now lately all the secrets of a lot of things have kind of come afloat and being declassified, I will say. Mm -hmm. So uh, has Estonia ever had to classify something, you don't have to tell me yes or not, but you know, and if so, is it somehow related to national security? I mean, every country has uh, classified information regarding national security. That's absolutely uh, elementary fact. Uh, you don't uh, disclose all the uh, military capabilities, you don't disclose all the details, how you act during crisis. Uh, that's kind of self-evident that you, you have this as uh, operation or procedure uh, a state secret. So and you don't disclose the fact that at Paldiski there was a secret UFO complex where you... I'm just kidding. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> like, uh, <laughs> what, what I can tell you is that uh, most state secrets are, uh, or, or a lot of them at least, are, are a lot uh, uh, less exciting than having UFOs in Paldiski. Yeah. Uh, so <laughs> <laughs> and with that, I didn't <laughs> either confirm or deny. We didn't deny. hear anything, we didn't hear anything. So, so it, it, can be, it can be like just, uh, you know, size or, or, um, or um, uh, tactical units of a brigade or something like that. It doesn't need to be UFOs, but it can be, it can be UFOs but, as well. But you did have some of these state secrets when you were the prime minister. Uh, you are not involved in politics any longer though. Do you just make yourself forget this information or do you have to sign a contract that you will never tell anyone anything? Oh, can you even share with your family? Like there, your is, uh, there is a pen that uh, comes out of the pocket. With, there are the guys with black suits and they come to you and then they Ooh, flash this to you. Man in black. Yeah, okay. Anyway, uh, I told you they had that stuff. But, but man the, in African American. But, but the answer, answer to your question, no, you cannot tell to your wife. And, and there have been cases of uh, sensitive information that you like uh, uh, cannot uh, disclose, disclose to any of your co-workers, even the colleagues in the government. Uh, there can be these kind of cases and, and you absolutely need to comply with this. So uh, it, if it is a state secret, then, then it's a state secret uh, for a good reason. And, uh, and you just don't uh, randomly talk about it with your friends, uh, even not in the sauna. No, not even in this spot. Not even in the summer. Well, we're running out of time, but he asked about UFOs. I have one state secret I have to ask him. Is, <laughs> is Urmas Alender still alive? And I was hoping you'd spit out your water as you drank. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm so sorry uh, that he's, he's uh, no longer with us. He was yeah. a great, uh, great singer. Huge and, talent. Um, yeah. Huge talent. Yeah. Well, Tavi Roivas, I'd like to thank you so much once again for being on our show, The Estonian Experience. I hope everyone enjoyed it. I'm Stuart. I'm Jason. And he's Tavi. See you later. Rivas. <laughs> Good pronunciation. <laughs>